Are you excited to build and explore your own haunted mansion? We certainly are. Watch out for betrayal amongst you though, in Betrayal at House on the Hill 3rd Edition. And today we'll be teaching you how to play Betrayal at House on the Hill. This game was originally designed by Bruce Glasgow and published by Avalon Hill. And hello everyone, it's Stella. And Tarrant here from Meeple University. Alright, let's go to the classroom. Now in its third edition, Betrayal at House on the Hill sees players play as a ragtag band of individuals thrown together in the classic horror movie trope of exploring a haunted mansion. The game plays in two halves. In the first half, players will simply explore the house, gathering useful items and traits, and discovering events through which they'll try not to hurt themselves too much. Then, at a random point somewhere in the middle, the game will turn. The haunt will begin, and in most cases, one player will be revealed a traitor and will betray the others. It's now a whole new scenario as different monsters, objectives and rules will take over. Whether traitor or victim, players will now work either together or against each other to achieve their own victories. The third edition, while mostly faithful to its predecessors, sees some rules tweaked and updated. And this video will be a complete teach of the game with no pre-assumed knowledge of prior editions. To set up, each player chooses a character, taking its mini and coloured base ring, noting that each player card has two different options. Take four clips and place one of them on each of your four trait gauges, pointing at the green coloured starting value. Give each player a reference card. Find the three room tiles showing the letter L and place them near each other on the table. Each of these is going to expand into a map representing a single level of the mansion. The upper floor, the ground floor and the basement. Shuffle up a stack of all of the remaining room tiles and place it nearby. Also shuffle up and place the three common decks of cards. The events, the items and the omens. Place all player minis in the entrance hall. Shuffle up the five blue scenario cards, choose one and read it out. This gives you an introduction to the story of why all of your characters are in this mansion. Keep it nearby as this is later going to help you figure out which of the haunt scenarios will be used. Keep the dice nearby. Each of these ranges in value between 0 and 2. Otherwise the game comes with over 100 individual tokens and almost all of these are used specifically in one or more of the haunt scenarios. You're not going to need these at game setup. Check all characters' birthdays and whosever birthday is soonest in real life will be the first player. You're now ready to play. Betrayal at House on the Hill is played in turns, starting from the first player and going clockwise around the table. During the first half of the game, you don't really know what's going to happen. In fact, thematically, your characters don't even know they're going to be betrayed. They're simply going to be exploring this haunted mansion for the reasons listed on your blue scenario card. As such, most of your turns will be spent moving and exploring and resolving new rooms. Besides this, you'll be able to trade things with other players in your room or use a special action, which is anything you encounter which has this icon. You'll be able to keep taking actions until either you choose to end your turn, you've run out of things to do, or once you've just finished exploring and resolving a newly placed room. So let's look at moving and exploring. To begin your turn, check your current speed trait. This is the number of movement points you have to spend this turn. Although your speed trait may change during your turn, the number of movement points you have remains fixed based on the start of your turn. With each movement point, you may move one space to an adjacent room. You may only travel through dividers which show a door icon on both sides. From here, these two rooms are valid destinations, while this room is not. Some rooms state that they lead to a specific other room, in which case those two rooms are considered adjacent as long as both of them are visible on the table. For example, ground floor staircase lets you move to the upper landing on the upper floor of the house. 
be aware that at setup there is no pre-discovered room which allows you to go down to the basement or the basement landing. You'll have to discover ways to get into and out of the basement as you play. If you walk through an open door with no room on the other side, then you discover a new room. Now add a tile from the room deck into that space. Each tile may have a restriction on which levels of the house it can be placed into. Here for example, it could only go into the upper or basement levels. Since you're on the ground floor, bury that tile, that is, move it to the bottom of the deck, and continue doing this until you find a tile which may validly be placed. Reveal the tile and then place it into the empty space in any orientation as long as the door you just moved through matches up with a door on the new tile. Other doors do not have to match and thematically they represent closets or alcoves. Now resolve any immediate effects for the room. If there is a when this tile is discovered text effect, resolve it now. Here you'd gain a mite, meaning you advance the marker on your mite track one step. If you discover a room with an icon in the corner, then resolve a card from the corresponding deck. The spiral is an event. Flip the top event and read the italicized text at the top. In most cases, you'll now be asked to make a die roll, either with a specific number of dice, or to roll against a specific trait. Here it's a might roll. So you would roll a number of dice equal to your character's current might. After rolling, count up the sum of the results and determine which of the effects you resolve. These will generally involve gaining or losing traits. An effect may tell you to take damage, which could be physical, mental or general damage. For physical damage, you must reduce either your might or your speed, or a combination of both. For mental damage, you'd reduce either your knowledge or your sanity. And for general damage, choose among all four traits. When a trait is reduced to the red number, it is considered critical. And your character will die if it loses another point from that trait. However, this is not allowed to happen before the start of the haunt. If I were to take physical damage now, then I would have to take it from might instead of speed. And if I got to the point where both physical traits were critical and I took more physical damage in the first half of the game, I would simply ignore that damage. If an effect ever tells you to heal a trait, then restore it from wherever it is all the way to its starting value. If you discover a room with this icon, then you find an item. Draw the top card from the item deck and add it to your collection. You may hold any number of items. Items include weapons. Later on, once the haunt has begun, you'll be able to use these in attack. Some items have the special action icon and you'll be able to use that special action once per turn. There are also some items which have an ongoing passive effect. If you're in the same room as another player and you're holding an item which you have not previously used on this turn, then you may give that item to that player. But once an item has been used on your turn, you're not allowed to trade it until your next turn. The final type of icon that you may come across is the omen icon, represented by the bird. Draw and gain the top card from the omen deck. Functionally, when it's in your possession, an omen card behaves exactly like an item card. It may have active or passive effects, and you can trade it with players in your space. However, thematically, these omen cards are much more creepy and mystical items than the standard item cards. And it's finding these which will bring forth the haunt. When you draw an omen, Count up the total number of omens now in play and roll that many dice. On a result of four or less, nothing happens. While on a roll of five or more, the haunt begins and the game is about to change. Also note, if you draw the last omen card, then the haunt begins without need for a roll. 
and there are also some events which trigger a haunt roll. Whatever happens, once you've finished resolving all icons on a room, your turn ends and those icons will never be resolved again. If you end in a room with an end of turn effect, resolve that now. After a successful haunt roll, the haunt begins and you'll reference and begin one of 50 separate scenarios which is contained within these two booklets. If the haunt roll was triggered by an event, then the event card will tell you which numbered haunt to refer to. Otherwise, flip your game's blue scenario card, look up the specific omen which triggered this roll, and that will tell you the haunt number and who will be the traitor. There are a few different types of scenarios, but in most cases there will be a single traitor identified here, and that's the type of haunt we'll talk about first. Usually whoever had the successful roll and revealed the haunt becomes the traitor, but in some cases there'll be another condition, and if tied you go with whoever is next in turn order. If you've got an inexperienced player who doesn't want to play as the traitor, you can also follow these instructions to pass responsibility to a willing participant. This will include exchanging the omen card which triggered the haunt between the players as this card often plays a role in the haunt. The non-traders take the Secrets of Survival book, turn to the chosen haunt, read the introduction out loud and follow the setup steps. Instructions may include four numbers in curly brackets and these would represent a number for a three, four, five or six player game. The traitor now finds the same haunt and likewise reads out loud the introduction and follows the setup steps. Now in real life, the players should split up. The traitor goes to one room and the other players go to another. This allows you to read and freely discuss and strategize anything you need to around the rest of the information on this haunt. You'll have an objective which tells you what you need to do to win. You'll be told which of the game's myriad tokens are needed for this haunt. Many scenarios use the number track, which you can use to count a number of effects or rounds. Sometimes there are specific rooms which are important to this particular haunt, and these will be listed in this box. Those rooms may still be in the room deck, and you'll have to keep exploring the house until you find them. Finally, there'll be other new rules and special actions which apply to this scenario. Everything below the setup box begins the haunt as a secret known only to your team. However, the first time you use or resolve an effect which is part of your secret information, you must reveal and explain it in full to the other team. I'll now explain the changes to the game's basic rules which occur once the haunt begins. Although, due to the wide variety of haunt scenarios, every one of these comes with the standard caveat, unless otherwise stated. Firstly, a traitor no longer suffers negative effects from room tiles, and when exploring new rooms, can choose to ignore event icons. After all, it turns out the traitor knew the secrets of this house all along. But if a traitor does choose to resolve an event, then they must take the result, good or bad. The traitor may control monsters, and there'll be specific tokens for each monster. Monster information includes traits and special abilities, and somewhere in the information it will tell you the monster's position in turn order. When a monster moves, rather than moving its speed, you will make a speed roll for the monster, and can then move up to the result. All monsters know of a secret passageway, which connects the basement landing to the ground floor staircase. They do not suffer damage from rooms and cannot hold items or omens. Player movement can now be impeded by obstacles. This can include any token identified as an obstacle or can include any token or player mini which is on the opposite team. That is, for the traitor, each survivor is an obstacle, and for the survivors, any monsters or traitors are obstacles. When moving, it costs two movement points instead of one to move out of a room containing one or more obstacles. Once per turn, if you're in the same room as an enemy, you may attack that enemy. 
There are also some weapons which let you attack at range, in which case you must have line of sight, meaning there is a valid straight line movement path between the attacker and the defender. Here, if blue had the crossbow, white and yellow would both be in line of sight, red would not be because of this wall. In an attack, each side may use the benefit of at most one weapon that they're carrying. And then each side makes a might roll. Here, this character would use three plus one bonus for the chainsaw, and this character would use four, adding one to the result. Roll the dice. With the machete bonus, this would be six against four, and whichever side rolled fewer successes suffers physical damage equal to the difference. When fighting a monster, if you were to deal damage, the monster doesn't suffer any permanent damage, but instead is stunned. While stunned, a monster doesn't count as an obstacle, and the monster spends its entire next turn flipping back to its unstunned side. In some cases, either through items or the effect of the haunt, an attack may be done with a roll other than might. When this happens, both attacker and defender always roll to the same trait, and if it were a physical trait being rolled, then the damage is physical, while if it were a mental trait being rolled, the damage is mental. Once the haunt begins, the pre-haunt restrictions on death are lifted. And if you ever lose your last point of any trait, then your character dies. Lie your piece down in its final resting place. Once per turn as a special action, any other character in your space may pick up a card that you are carrying. And note that in some haunts, traitors or monsters may need to interact with a player's corpse. On that happy note, continue playing until one team meets its objective, and that team will be the winner. In addition to the standard one versus many mode, there are three other types of haunts, free for all, no traitor, and hidden traitor. In hidden traitor, all players read the same information from the survival guide, and will each get dealt a random number token face down, with a specific number taking on the role of traitor. In this way, you'll know from the start that you're the traitor, but the other players won't know it's you. For a no traitor scenario, you'll also all read the same information in the survival guide, and this time you'll be playing fully cooperatively against the game. Finally, in a free for all, all players will read the information from the traitor's tome. This is now a fully competitive scenario, which will have a single winner among all the players. Keep in mind that when the haunt begins, it's not always going to be a 50-50 chance between the two sides winning. Sometimes one side just begins with a much better chance of victory. Just keep in mind that this game is as much role play and story as it is challenge. And you can still tell a great story, even from a hopeless situation. And that's how to play Betrayal at House on the Hill, 3rd edition. Thanks so much for watching. Your like and comments are much appreciated. Subscribe to see what's coming and hopefully you have a wonderful day. See you next time.